Welcome back to Conversations with Glenn Taylor. In this episode, we learn about Glenn's college career, his study habits, class schedule, and the independent projects that would allow him to graduate in just three years. Glenn describes the challenges of finding work while attending college and his incredibly busy schedule during that time. He also shares the story of having to start his car on cold winter nights to ensure it would run the next morning. And he offers his thoughts on classes and teachers he enjoyed the most. I'd gone to Comfrey. I had no idea how well I was educated because I didn't have anybody to compare myself to except my fellow classmates. And, and with them, I always wanted to be the, get the best grade. It was always important for me to do well. And I did very well at school. Matter of fact, when I looked at my report cards from school, everyone was an A except for one quarter. I got a B plus in typing. But I went to college and I started college within a week after getting out of high school. I went up to MSU and when I went into the classroom, it was during the summer, so I looked around and there was no other student there that had just gotten out of high school. Everybody was there further along in their education or was a teacher coming back for more education. That really worried me because how would I compare to them? But within a couple of weeks, I found out that I probably could get the best score of anybody in that class. And I found out that Comfrey High School gave me a really good education, better than I ever thought was possible. And college remained that way, that I could divide it down to my um, physics and and math classes on which I had to study really hard. You had problems. I had to get those done. But of course, I took the subjects of uh, psychology or, or health or other things in which were, were different. What I learned fr from high school that I was taught is to make an outline. And so I never missed a class. I didn't read all the material, but I really listened to the teacher and I'd make an outline of their presentation. And it was just a matter of putting down certain words that I could uh, check on. And what I found out is that before I took a test, if I went back and read my outline, I could pretty much be prepared to take a test in any subject and do well. So that, that helped me. In my education, I tried to get my classes in the morning and I tried to take uh, as many as I could. I was helped by some, some of my professors who gave me kind of like an individual project. It really wasn't a class project like this modern math one I was talking about. They said, would you study this, write a paper and do it on it, and we'll give you four credits. I mean, I could do that, I could do that off uh, time and I didn't have to go into the classroom to do that. So. Uh, that was uh, really helpful. But I basically tried to take my classes in the morning, get up at eight, get to school, and then sometime uh, take a class at from 12 to one, so that gave me another time period. That one, a lot of times I walk to work, I'd take, I'd walk to work, I'd get there a little, so I'm getting a little after one, punch in, so I, would try to get my four hours in, but I always stayed till maybe two hours late, so I got six hours in. And, and then I worked, always worked on Saturdays, so, so Saturday made up to try to get my 80 or 40 hours on Saturdays. And then on Tuesday nights, I washed the floor uh, with the, the janitor I volunteered to come in that. So to get my hours in, you know, it was like, six hours of working for Mr. Carlson, then um, Saturdays I stocked the shelves, did the, all that stuff, get ready, and then Tuesday nights I probably was just two hours scrubbing the floors and stuff like this here. Then my brother worked for um, the drugstore, did the same thing that I did, and then on Sundays, <laughs> sometimes as he needed help, I would go down with him and we'd wash the floors up uh, before people uh, came in the, the store at um, nine or 10 o'clock, we, we did that. Then uh, 
came home, uh, ate supper with, with Glenda and Terry and stuff like that there, kind of did my play thing with uh, Terry. And basically, at her age at that time, I mean, she's really energetic because she's a couple years old and in that thing. And she just wanted to do a lot of little roughing stuff and playing and tickle and hide and seek and stuff like that, which was really so different from my regular work that it was fun, it was fun to do. And we did it as sort of as a family, all of us kind of just pitched in. And we put her to bed. And once, once, we, once we put her to bed, uh, she was always kind of in the same room with us, but we put her to bed. And then uh, that was my study time. And I had a little chair and a little table that I did that. And then Glenda would uh, do the dishes and stuff like this here. I had a car, uh, Ford, 49. And it was a nice little car, except that it didn't start very easy. So in the winter time, I knew it wouldn't start in the morning if the temperature was a certain temperature, and I forget what that was, but I'm gonna say if it was like 20 degrees outside at night, there wasn't a chance it was gonna start. So at two o'clock, I had to get up with my pajamas on, walk outside, the car sat outside, it didn't have, we didn't have a garage, start the car up, let it run for 20 minutes, <laughs> warm up the water, <laughs> shut it off, go back upstairs, crawl back in bed, and go to sleep. I did that a lot of nights and stuff like this here. It's funny, I didn't fall asleep in the car and end up being down there all night. But yeah, it was really, it was really, uh, life was really good. We always went to church. We never gave up church. Uh, that was Sunday morning and uh, did that. And it was a little longer because I didn't have any money to give the church. I mean, I'd probably, I don't know if I stuck in a dollar or 50 cents, you know, or something like that. It would have been the most. But, but uh, what I decided to do, because I didn't have any money to give the church, is to teach Sunday school. So, so I always stayed after church, had an hour with the kids and taught Sunday school. That was my way of contrib contribution to the church and stuff like that's here. We tried to, on Sunday, uh, take Terry out to the park, it, maybe just a swing park. Uh, I know we went out to Miniopa a number of times because that was really pretty and stuff like this here. But, uh, but that's why w the three years, I mean, we set our goal. We know we just had to, we had to get through because I was getting tired of it and stuff like this here. But I was able always to get good grades. I was always able to hand, hand in my work. I don't recall ever quitting a class. I don't think that ever happened that I started a class and quit because of something uh, that uh, like I didn't think I could finish it or something like that. I was, was confident that I could get a B or an A in a class, but uh, that's about how it worked. It was, it was, it was busy. I took the study of the moons and the, the stars and the stuff like this here. And I took that class. I love that class. To this day, that stuff interests me. So besides my major, I did take, I did take some other classes like that that were just independent ones. And they just had excellent teachers who loved their things. I took a, some history classes. I just loved them. I think they were early American and one European I took just, these are the ones, the throw-ins that you have to get your credits that I, I took. So the answer to your question, yeah, there was other things to this day that really interest me. History, about the stars and how that all works. I still read about that stuff. How does that all work? So I didn't really run into anything that I hated. I liked everything. I generally judged the teacher. I ran into some teachers that I thought were really poor teachers. And it was, I thought those, boy, this is a waste of time. They could be up here making this class exciting. So, and I'm still in, into that today, the leadership thing, the people having a good teacher that does it, that makes a class exciting. So, you know, when I kind of evaluate my education, 
I was really, high school, really good teachers, almost all of them. College, I was really fortunate that, that I just, the math department was small, so they cared about you, and physics department was small, so they cared about you. But some of the other classes, you know, like English and stuff, they had pretty big things. And you could end it up with all kinds of teachers. Basically what I did, I always went to some students and asked them who they took and then sort of lined up a teacher that they said really interesting, really fun. So I probably eliminated most of that just by doing my work before I signed up for a class. I think it even went better than I had planned. I think I took some stuff and probably didn't even know why I was taking it. And in most cases, when I was finished with it, it came out, boy, am I glad I took this, but I didn't really <laughs> probably understand stood it when I first signed up. Uh, I just didn't have classes like that. I was really lucky. When I found a good teacher, and if they were teaching some other classes, <laughs> I made sure I took their classes. Glenn was always an exceptional student, but he did end up in a challenging physics class. He tells us that story and talks about the work ethic and drive it took to earn his degree in only three years. I wanted to graduate in three years, and I wanted to get through, so I got down to the last quarter, and I was looking for classes to take, and so I signed up for a physics class, and, uh, and it was on a night class. So I went to the class the first night, and the teacher, there was about 50 of us in the class, and the teacher started on this classwork, and I thought, this is hard. I don't even know if I know what the teacher's talking about. So after the second week of being in that class, I went up to the teacher and said, this is really hard for me to understand. And, uh, and um, could you help me? And he asked me, he said, well, are you a major in physics? And I said, no, that's my minor. But uh, he says, you're not supposed to be in this class unless you're a major and I'm teaching it only to the top students here at the school. And I said, well, here's the book. The book says that if you have a minor, you can take this class. Well, it may say that, but that's not how I'm teaching it. That really put me in a predicament because now if I didn't finish that, class, I'd have to go to summer school, and I didn't want to go to summer school, so I stayed in there. But the interesting thing was, by the time we finished that, taking that night class for the eight weeks that we had to take it, there was just 10 of us left in the class out of the 50. Everybody else had dropped out. And then he gave us a final test, and it was a hard test and I took it. And tell you the truth, I, I only thought I needed to get a D. I never had a D in my life, but if I got a D, it still counted as a credit and I was gonna pass. So <laughs> I said I'd work really hard to get a D. And so I took the test, handed it in with the other nine students, and a couple days later, I went up to the professor's uh, office and knocked on the door and says, could I talk to you about the test that I took? I was kind of wondering how I did. Well, he says, I haven't made up my mind yet what I'm gonna give you. You know, he says, and I says, well, between what? He says, I don't know if it's a B or a B plus that I'm gonna give you. I can remember I turned around <laughs> and walked out that door. I was so relieved I couldn't believe that uh, I had made it through uh, college and getting all top grades and, and uh, graduated. I can really remember graduating, parents and everybody and came down and we celebrated and, and Glenda and I and, and then the, the first Sunday came up. It was like, what are we gonna do Sunday? We're gonna put Terry to bed and she can take a nap and the both of us are gonna take naps. <laughs> it felt so good to take a nap and know that you weren't cheating on, on something like that. So, uh, so life was really easy after college. Now I worked six days 
a week for Mr. Carlson. But you know, remember on the farm, I worked seven days a week. So we, we had Saturdays off, worked for Mr. Carlson, we had Saturdays off. It just seemed like, you know, s Saturday evening. Um, we met with, on Saturday evening, we would do things like some other couples that were in town that had little babies and stuff like this here. We would get together, we'd go up to A&W, get some ice cream, get some root beer, and just sit around playing cards and, and, and that was our entertainment. Uh, we didn't spend very much money. The only money I ever remember we really spent is A&W root beer, and that was kind of our treat. But uh, we did that, but life seemed easy then uh, compared to what it had been before. You were wondering if that philosophy of getting it done in three years carries over. I would, the example I would give you is right now that I use uh, to my uh, leaders and stuff like this here. I says, if you have a problem and you want it resolved, come into my office. I can guarantee you in 15 minutes after you come through the door, you'll go out with, <laughs> you'll go out with an answer. And it's sort of like, well, whatever decision I'm going to make, I, it isn't going to be perfect, and I know it isn't going to be perfect, so why spend a lot of time on it? Just do the best you can. And usually the person that brings you in the opportunity or, or problem really can push you along a long ways on it. They sort of know what to do. They're just asking you to give them support, and that's why I can make those decisions really fast. Glenn continued his education at Harvard. These business and management classes challenged him and taught him important lessons he would bring back to Taylor. I went into business. Eventually, I bought the company from Mr. Carlson, and I knew that I did not have a business degree. I knew I lacked in that area. And so I saw that they had this class out at Harvard that it was just called a management class. You had to be a, like a CEO of a, of a company of a fast-growing company. I signed up for it. It was unusual, in other words, that I had to go out there. I lived in the dorm with other, by, other people, but everybody there was a CEO. 30% uh, of the students were foreign students and 70% of us were from the United States or Canada. And I took this class. Again, I just wondered how I would compare against the top students going to Harvard and, and doing that. It was really educational. I found out only after a couple of weeks that I could write a paper, do as well as anybody else in that class out there, which was really, really helpful. Pretty much the education was they would give you a company that was either very successful or went into bankruptcy and tell you about it maybe five years before the final results and ask you, how would you run this company if it was your company and you had to write the report? And you'd work on that for a week. You'd come in and show them, the professor what you had done and they would send you another direction or say you're missing something and you would have to re-study the company and, and write the report. I really enjoyed that because it was challenging and they were real companies, a lot of them which I knew the name of and uh, they were in business uh, today. But I also took some other classes, and I took a bunch of them, but I want to share, and I do share this with, uh, in my talks. So one was um, a class in which the first day of the class, the te teacher was talking about a company and, uh, and kind of saying, and all the things that this company does, which is the most important? Now he was driving you to say, well, I think marketing is probably the most important for this company. Another company would say, well, finance is the most important thing. And another person would say, technology is the most important thing. But basically he let us draw it down to about seven things that were very important. And he says, well, you're wrong on all of those. And he says, what is the most, uh, and I think we had been in class already probably a whole week, but at the end of this, he says, no, the most important thing 
is the worst thing. And, and I understood, as soon as he said that, I understood what he's saying. He said that if you had seven things, but one thing you were the furthest behind, that's going to pull back the other six. And, and you can't get ahead any further than your worst thing. So he says you work on the worst thing, and if it's marketing, you bring your marketing program up to a satisfactory. But just by logic, there's another worst thing. They're, ne they're never equal. There's always something that's fallen behind the other thing. And he basically says that's the way you have to run your company. That's the way you will run your company if you're going to be successful. You will always take the worst thing, bring it up to a higher level, and eventually you're bringing the whole company out up you're doing one one at a time i really enjoyed that class because we we studied a whole bunch of companies we th threw that theory at it and it's something that i've always looked at this company that uh, that i lead today and we're doing the same thing you know we get behind in technology sometimes sometimes we're behind in in uh in uh, marketing and and we work on it so it's one of those things that i first heard that out there that I've uh, kept uh, with me uh, my whole life. Another class, and the whole class was titled Win-Win. And I remember looking at it that they had a thing called Win-Win. And it just said, and I, my head said, this is a pinky thing. Win-Win, if you play sports, there's a winner and there's a loser. <laughs> there is no winner and winner and went to the class and they said, no, there's a theory that both people win. And you can, and we'll, we're gonna show you how, how to do that. And again, they gave us projects. They would take three of us, we were on a team, and we would be represent a company, and then there would be three of them on another team, and either one was acquiring, acquiring the other team or buying something from them, but the two companies they had to work together and resolve and come out with something at the end. And then they had, there was, say, about 10 of those sets of um, uh, six. So we had about 60 of us in there. But there was three and three. And then uh, we worked on that. And we worked on it for quite a while. But they kept feeding us new information as we were going along. They didn't have a static thing. The professor would say, well, here's some new news that we just found out and they would feed that to you. At the end of the class or after working on it for a couple of weeks, you would then, each team would come in and say, well, we have finished negotiations and this is what we're paying for the company or that we were receiving this and he put it on the board. And it was interesting to find out that there was a group of companies right in the middle that were all about the same and they were win-win and they had negotiated long enough to come out. The seller was happy and the buyer was happy and they had, had to work this out. And that was their whole point of trying to leave something on the table so that both parties were happy with that. And when I thought about the logic, it was pretty logical. It wasn't as complicated as I thought, except that I took that and ever since then, whenever we've bought a company or we're negotiating, I've used that concept that let something so that the other party wins a little bit and, and thinks it's a good deal. But it, I hadn't thought about it as clearly as I had before I went into, in, into that uh, project.